This is the third episode of Lucid Horizons. Um, I'm Alayar Kengarlu, and tonight I'm with uh, Dr. Hushang Amir Ahmadi. And tonight we're going to continue our conversation about uh, education and democracy and all the other relevant parameters that affects proliferation of, of democracy in the lands where democracy has not existed previously and reinforcement of democracy in the lands and the countries that it has existed before. Our conversation in the last two weeks brought us to the point of uh, highlighting the role of uh, nationalism. And uh, tonight we are going to pick up where, from where we left off and we are going to tell you what we think nationalism, what's the role of nationalism and how nationalism can uh, help uh, the, uh, the spread of, of uh, democracy and liberal democracy, the liberal brand of democracy and how uh, we can understand uh, their interaction. Uh, so uh, right out, out of the outset, let me, let me tell you, Professor Amir Ahmadi, that uh, my take on nationalism is, uh, is uh, is a phenomenon, is a feeling, is an ideology, is a perspective that is against liberalism. So liberals have always frowned upon nationalism and they view nationalism as something that stands against the values of liberalism. But, uh, but if, you, if you think about it, uh, I mean, it, 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 this is probably because, you know, uh, liberalism is associated with cosmopolitanism. And by cosmopolitanism, I mean uh, values of human liberty and human individualism that really transcends national borders and geography and tribalism and, and culturalism. And so from that point of view, I, I understand, you know, why should some people think that nationalism and liberalism uh, represent opposite values. But tonight we're going to talk about why nationalism and liberalism can be serving the same purpose and what are the common grounds of nationalism and, and liberalism. So uh, let's, uh, let me ask you to just briefly describe what your understanding is of nationalism and liberalism so that we can you know, take, take the issue from there and try to understand the differences and commonalities. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, that's a very, very, very important uh, question you are raising. And I do agree with your uh, view that somehow liberalism uh, and, and nationalism uh, have become uh, antagonistic uh, concepts for at least uh, certain groups. I don't think that is the case for all. And, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I believe for a long time, nationalism and liberalism did go hand in hand until I believe uh, around the 1930s, perhaps, when nationalism in Europe uh, became synonymous to fascism. And in fact, uh, it was the Hitler, the Nazi movement, that uh, gave that nationalism a bad name and that uh, somehow it was uh, considered a, a violent, fascistic, uh, anti-liberal movement, anti-democratic, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you go back to the history uh, a, bit, a bit deeper, uh, you see that that wasn't the case. For one thing, nationalism in the simplest form is your love for your nation. There is nothing more into it. Nationalism is that, that you love your nation and it, wasn't, and it did not mean that you hate other nations that you love your nation more than other nations, perhaps. As uh, uh, President Trump famously said as in his speech at the UN, he said, you know, I say America first, and that's our right to have our country first. You, leaders of the world, also have the right to say my country is the first and have to struggle for that. There is no problem with it, and I will have no problem with it. 
I think that was a very important statement he made. Uh, nationalism, in fact, first it predates uh, liberalism, it predates capitalism, and it predates democracy. Let's first put it historically. Nationalism, you know, developed after, you know, uh, the, the, so the nation state became the building block of our new world. I mean, still, as we speak, the building block of our world, whether you are a globalist or a nationalist, the building block of this world is still nation, a nation, a nation's. Now, what the nation really means is, uh, is, a, is, is a phenomenon, something that, you know, as you said, it's, 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 it has many dimensions to it. Of course, a nation cannot be a nation unless that nation has a certain critical minimum number of people, the population, the people. And that, that people cannot form a nation until and unless they have a geography of their own. There has to be a geography in which these people live. Otherwise, there is no nation. And then all nations, without exception, have a government or a state, that's what we call it, the nation state. Nation state, the state is a prerequisite of a place to be called a nation without a state, without a government, without an entity out there that rules the place, there is no nation. Every nation has obviously its own history, sometimes combined with others, and its culture, its civilization, all kinds of values, creeds, and so on. And then, of course, a nation doesn't exist in vacuum. It exists within the framework of other nations. And that's the issue of international relations and, and uh, you know, the place of a nation in that particular uh, world order and so on. So these are the five uh, broad dimensions that make something a place, a, a nation. So now I don't so what is wrong with any of this that should go against liberalism? I mean, what is, I mean, I, I cannot see anything wrong with this entity that the way I defined it to go against anything, people. No, a nation is a combination of people. Are anybody out there that can say, no, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to accept that, that I'm going to deny that a nation should have a number of people, that I am denying that people have borders, political borders, a geography, that I'm denying that people have a state, that I'm denying that they have a culture of their own, their way of life, history, or that I, that I don't believe that they have any international relation or should have. So, so in a way, whether you, the globalist and anybody else likes it or not, nation as a unit of this global community is a reality. Now, to that extent, the people who live in that place, the geog their geography, their the way of life, their culture, and so on, you know, it's, it's, it's quite particular to that place. And of course, they have every right to consider themselves sovereign, independent, but at the same time, a member of this larger community called global or this. Unfortunately, the globalists misunderstand this concept. And why they misunderstand this concept is because they see global as borderless something. 
For example, for GM, the world is a globe and that it doesn't matter where the border is drawn politically. They, they say, I, as long as I can sell my car wherever I can, that is the, my geography. That is my geography. All right. In fact, this is not a new idea that GM or, or, or Ford or others came up with. It existed from the day we created human history or the civilization, and more importantly, existed from the day that religion or religions developed. Remember, all religions, regardless of what it is, they are borderless. They are geographyless. Their container is not a nation. Their container is the globe. Islam, Christianity, Judaism, it doesn't matter. So, so nationalism indeed is the most secular, secular idea about organizing a place for the sake of a group of people and geography. That is, it really is a liberation from the religion. Globalists are largely, in a way, whether they like it or not, they are more close to the religion. They are more connected to the, uh, like, you know, international communism or, or uh, and other stuff that are the you know large global team. You know, it's funny that in the capitalism now you have globalists and they forget that globalism started with Stalin and Lenin. And before that with Marx, these were globalists. And before Marx started with Islam, you know, the That's international right. international That's community of Muslims or Ummah. Exactly. What I'm saying is the, the, the progression is from the religion to communism to globalism. So perhaps, and, the, uh, Professor Amir Ahmadi, perhaps at this point, I'm going, to, I'm going to interject a little bit of my perspective that might be please, please, tragically please. wrong. It might be erroneous. So this is my take on, on this whole issue because it's a very difficult, difficult issue and it's a very important issue. And I, think, and I think it's really very relevant to, you know, it's really ironic that it's very relevant to the crisis that democracy is facing in the democratic world and the crisis that the uh, societies without democracy is, are also facing. And, you know, this, I'm really celebrating this commonality at the same time that I'm really fearful of, uh, of uh, human beings inability to solve the problem and eventually erupting in their face <coughs> in the form of some, an, another global war, another world war. I, we, you know, and in, in all these efforts, in all the things that we are doing, in all these conversations and all the, you know, exchange of ideas that we are doing, we are trying to exactly prevent that. We are hoping that, you know, we can contribute a little bit to the understanding, you know, the commonality of our understandings and, and how we can spread peace and understanding. So this is my take on all this problem. So I see things in an evolutionary fashion, in an evolutionary pattern. I see that you know humans when humans evolved and became the first thinking animal at least a, a, a complex thinking animal because other animals think too but you know the our our thinking is a function of our attention span you know we it's been said that dogs have only 3 seconds attention span uh, you know and and at the same time on the other side of the coin uh, Einstein has said that the biggest achievement of human being is the fact that they've been able to sit down in one place for a long time and work on boring subjects. So attention span, if you can really focus your attention on a very otherwise, you know, something, that, an issue that is, has been viewed by other people as boring, that could be a sign of intelligence. And, and whether it's intelligence or whatever we can call it at this point, it doesn't matter. That's an attribute of humans. So humans develop this capability of thinking and, and comprehending and pondering against nature. So 
Now the, and, and then the next thing after the human psyche and the human attention span and human mind, which is the most complex entity in nature, is that humans, these individuals with this characteristic, with the characteristic of thinking, they decided to socialize. So socialization is a very important aspect of human dimension, human, uh, dimension of human character. So now the question is that now these humans, these individuals, the thinking individual decided to really seek happiness and prosperity and, and whatever you know, <laughs> the purpose to life is in the context of socializing with his peers. So now we are faced with this dichotomy individualism and socialism so we have so now 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 th this is what we are confronting and this is something that you know john mersheimer who is you know one of my most favorite uh, social theorists uh, you know he's been pondering on and he's been talking about and you know i like uh, all of his arguments about the dichotomy between individualism and socialism so now from my point of view we are really confronted with this question are we individual entities and i mean what is more dominant in human character their individuality or their social dimension is the is the social dimension of human beings so dominant that we are ready to suppress our individuality or our individuality <laughs> is so dominant that we are going to we are we are prepared to do away with the pleasures from from seeking the pleasures of social uh, uh, association with our with our peers now in the social dimension of our life so you know in what context do humans experience social uh, pleasure in the context of relationship with the family that's the smallest cell social cell and and then from there on in your neighborhood and in your town and in your tribe and in your culture in your nation and so on so uh, now, so we are, I think, I think what we are looking at, you know, especially because of the, because of this dichotomy between liberalism and nationalism, and whether we can even talk about the phenomenon <clears throat> called national liberalism or liberal nationalism, whether these two entities are, you know, are, are combinable, can we combine them or are they mutually exclusive? I think they can be combined. I think nationalism is a vehicle in which all the liberal ideals can really be materialized and you know unfortunately you know the experiences that we've had in the past that nationalism has been taken to extremes in the form of ultra nationalism and fascism and 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 at the expense and ver the versions of nationalism that have excluded uh, other nations and other cultures and other societies and, and hating nationalism rather than loving nationalism, destructive nationalism rather than constructive nationalism. This, this is something that you know, we, have, we have in our baggage, in our past, in our history. And we have to come clean with that. We have to try to understand the fact that nationalism can be constructive, nationalism can be useful, <laughs> and we should not throw away the, 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 the baby with the bathtub. We should not do away with the merits of nationalism at a time that uh, that some people are trying to use nationalism and really divide us into tribes and groups, into Democrats and Republicans, into white blacks and whites, into poors and 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 rich and and really split our societies. The polarization that we experienced in this society in America and in Europe and in the rest of the world is so alarming that I think it it warrants for us to really spend some time trying to understand the merits of nationalism and see whether we can bring nationalism back into the fold of liberalism and and be able to use that idea and that concept as a as 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 a means of reconciliation in the united states and and in europe yeah well, thank you that very very illuminating very interesting uh, good observations, and I really like what you said. And I also uh, strongly believe that uh, that nationalism and, and, and liberalism are not, uh, uh, you know, contradictory uh, uh, ideas or ideologies, uh, 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 or and so and so on. Uh, let me 
uh, I mean, we have obviously, uh, first, as I said, we have a nation. Every, every, the, this world is com composed of nations. So nations are real. And, and then, but as long as the nation is real, nationalism and avoidably is real. However, it, I mean, depends on how would you uh, characterize it. For example, let me explain. There is, we have economic nationalism, we have political nationalism, we have cultural nationalism, and, and so on. That is, people, who are very preserving of their culture, people are preserving their economy, economic interests, and people who are uh, observing of their political, you know, uh, sovereignty and so on. For one thing, I, I don't believe there is a nation out there that is developed, that is progressed, that is democratic, that is liberal, that is not nationalistic to begin with. Nationalism has, for them, has become an uh, you know, it's, it's a tool, perhaps, in, for some of them, but they're all nationalistic. In this very country, United States of America, agriculture is very protected. In, in France, agriculture is extremely protected. You have to go through a hell to get something in it, okay? Politically, they struggle all the time for independence, for sovereignty, and nobody wants to be subjugated by the other. They all, they're all preserving of their culture. So let's just first start with the reality that, that uh, I think those people who say we are national, we are globalists, they are indeed uh, saying that our nationalism is global, <laughs> as opposed to saying, we are globalists, meaning we have no nationalism. I don't believe there is a national globalist out there that is not nationalist, and unless that person is a traitor <laughs> to its nation. You know, we can see it from, I mean, Trump administration versus Biden. Is that Biden less nationalistic? No, I don't think it's that. Let's see how it deals with the border matters. Now, but, but the, the way he explains the globalism and nationalism is a bit different. Let me uh, then go back to certain uh, key things here. As, you know, after the Europe developed this nation states, you know, after, you know, uh, and then they gradually developed what became known as mercantilism. The, the nations that were able to develop a strong state and a strong army and military, they became colonialists. They started taking over Africa, Asia, and other places, subjugating them, ripping them off, of these resources, whatever they had, from the minerals to gold and silver. That's what colonialism was. And that on the basis of that rip, rip up, they became wealthy and developed, you know, uh, capital. And that capital then led to capitalism, that is the, which originated from the industrial revolution that now, industrial revolution and that capitalism was very nationalistic. Capitalism developed in London, in England, in Manchester. They did not develop that in African cities. They were very much national. And the British, for example, were very nationalistic about what they were doing. They were extremely protective of what they were doing. The nationalism is just like that. So they were, they basically said, we are a, a different kind of a people. In fact, uh, I have a quote from an, a British educator who in 1883, 1882, no, yeah, 1883, yeah, some, somewhere around that time, 1833, I believe, I'm not right, uh, who said that he was asked, what are you doing in India? 
Someone asked him, Mr. Minister, what Britain is doing in England, in, 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 in India? The man responded to say, well, we are trying to create an Indian in India that looks like Indian, but they taste like British. <laughs> the taste is British. The way of life is British. You know, they look like they look like Indian, but that's all they are. Otherwise, everything could be be wanted to be us. That is, they started this idea of universalism, of this Western values. That's a very good segue to our next uh, segment. Uh, yeah. about about internationalism and the influence of uh, countries on countries and how liberalism could result and evolve into globalism. So, you know, we talked about in the previous episodes, uh, we talked about the fact that since liberalism is based on the uh, nobility and the ultimate value of individualism and individuals, you know, all the rights and all the merits and all the virtues reside within individuals, Therefore, individuals are no different whether they are on one side of the of a border or another side of the border. And because of this emphasis on individualism and the values of, of, of human liberty, uh, basically uh, the, the, the boldness of uh, borders disappear, borders become less relevant. And as a result, people who, whose uh, ideology and whose perspective to politics is uh, painted by liberalism will become cosmopolitan and become internationalist and globalist. And as a result, they will have less emphasis on nationalism. So that's one aspect of defining liberalism. And so let, let's, let's, let's see what kind of problem it has created and whether, whether there is any truth to that, the fact that liberalism eventually results into globalization and into globalism and the, at least a cosmopolitan uh, uh, perspective to politics that um, puts less emphasis on nationalism. And, uh, you know, we kind of see something like that happening with the flight of, of uh, capital and technology and science from Europe and the United States to China. And the fact that the cosmopolitan left in Europe and the United States did not consider China as a threat as it was politically to, to the nationalists of Europe and the United States and how this uh, absence of alarmism about China's uh, sense of nationalism and our absence of sense of nationalism. In other words, if you're living in a world, let's say if you're living in a neighborhood where you don't really care whether your resources are shared with the neighbor, but the neighbors are very, very, uh, you know, jealously guarding their, their values, you know, this is going to eventually cause a problem. You know, this is, this, this is really at the heart of the problem that we are, we are ob uh, observing between the elitists, the elites in the, in the United States and Europe, and the alienation of, uh, of the middle class and the lower middle class with the elites. The, the, the middle class and, and the lower middle class is resorting to nationalism because they think that the elites, the cosmopolitan elites, they have abandoned their nationalism, a virtue that they keep dear and very close to their heart. And they think that you know, these elitists are really some nationless, some valueless, some globalist individuals who have no allegiance to America or to Europe, and all they're seeking is a few feasts full of dollars, and uh, profit is their ultimate criteria. And this profit seeking liberal values is what has destroyed the values of the world. And that's why we see the rise of, of uh, patriotism and ultra nationalism. And that's why we see that the nationalists, when they, when they rise to power, the first thing that they embolden the first thing that they, they, that they emphasize is uh, building the wall across the borders because they want to go back to nationalism. And, um, and is, the, is, is, it, is it really possible to gain nationalism, its virtues, its original values? And, and by original values, I mean nationalism as a vehicle to achieve liberal democracy. 
and nationalism as a source of pride of a nation, not necessarily at the price of the pride of other nations. If I'm proud to be American, it doesn't mean that I hate French. It doesn't mean that I hate Mexicans. I can love to be American as much as I love to see Mexicans to be Mexicans and French to be French, because I know what nationalism did to me as a vehicle to help me arrive at the, at the, at, at the merits of liberalism. And I want the same thing for other, national, uh, for other nationalities. Do you think there is any merit to this new emergence and the rise of liberal nationalism? It certainly is. Let me, again, uh, take a look at the history in you know, this way. First, uh, first uh, the, let's, let's not forget that every idea, nationalism or liberalism or democracy or capitalism, every idea is based on a set of assumptions. And in this particular, in social science, the most important assumption is about human nature. That is the key. That is what kind of animal we human be, be, being are. We are. Are we social? Are we individual? If we are individual, are we greedy? Are we profit seeker, maximizer, and so on and so forth? If there has been always a debate on this, on the human nature. Some people have argued, you know, some philosophers have argued that the human nature is, is social. But depending on the environment, that nature could change to becoming individualistic and increasingly so, and not just individualistic in terms of the political liberty, but also in terms of their economic interests, maximizer of their, their whatever they want. Now, this is extremely important. And on that basis, the argument has always been that whether, and this is another uh, assumption, what is a good society? Is a good society a society where people consume, have everything they want, have fun, OK? Uh, oh, and, and they, are, they are free to do whatever they want. Again there, again, there has been a lot of discussion over that. And some people say a good uh, society is a society that cares for others as well, as opposed to just for themselves, you know, uh, and, or the individual or the, the group. So first, I wanted to just make sure that we don't forget the fact that a lot of these ideas are based on certain assumptions that philosophers, that theoreticians, and others have made. and. Uh, uh, I call you back in a second. Uh, that so that's one issue. The second issue is, as I said, nationalism. When you talk about nationalism, a nation has took the, 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 the it has people, right? Now, these people have two sides to them. One side is that they are individuals, a human being. And as a human being, that assumption holds. What? The assumption of that person is a greedy person, you know, is a maximizer, uh, you know, it wanted to become, it wanted to be liberal, liberated, and uh, to be free from the yoke of the, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, serfdom or slavery or capitalism, wanted to be free. And then the second dimension of that individual is that that person is a citizen. The person is a citizen, the citizen of a, a nation defined as a group of people with a geography, you know, and so on that I explained. Now, these are two completely different uh, entities. As individual, yes, we are free, but as citizens, we may not be all that free because we, our freedom is limited, okay, by certain borders set by the social entities, political entities, the laws, regulations, and so on. Is the America, America 
is that Americans are liberal, liberated, they are free. Yeah, they are free as long as they don't trespass my, my, my property. Immediately, the guy, the guy comes to my property, I call police, and he's arrested. Okay, or as long as he doesn't pass the red light. Immediately, he passes the red light, he's, he's given a ticket, taken to court. The point I'm trying to make is that we need to distinguish between these two individuals, the citizen and the individual as a human being. And now, capitalism developed on the basis of the first, originally. Capitalism made the assumption that, that human beings, people, are individualistic, they are greedy, they are maximizer, uh, the so-called uh, invisible hand of Adam Smith, that all of these invisible hands are operating in a society, and that invisible hand of individuals leads to betterment of the larger picture. Now, we know for fact that that didn't work, that these assumptions, you know, that capitalism developed imperfections, they developed problems, and, and so on. So, but still, while the issue of human nature increasingly is come into question because of the imperfections of the market, of the imperfection of the invisible hand, but we know one thing did not come into question and have expanded is definition, and that's citizenship. And citizenship is inevitably connected to nationalism, connected to a nation, and to by definition, by extension, to nationalism. Now, here is the problem. The citizens are not all equal. They were not all equal. There were the poor people, there were the working class, there were the middle class, there were the upper class, there were the millionaires, billionaires, there were the Rockefellers and you know, Fords and Chryslers and, and so on. So those groups that were on the upper side, they increasingly started demanding a larger nation because they were capitalist businessmen and they did not see the limit of the nation enough for their business. So they, they began expanding. Originally in the form of colonialism, then in the form of new colonialism, in just, just international trade, international finance, international economic stuff, and, and so on. And this group, this, this group that expanded increasingly became globalist. Globalist only on the basis of its interest, on the basis of its property. Even in the United States, those people who voted for Biden are, I would tell you, 90% of them are not globalists. They don't even understand what globalism is. They have no interest in globalism. They are local. These are people who live in particular communities, in localities, and so on. And their life really is hit and, and determined by the localities. All right? They feel at the local level the gas station, the price there. All right? So it is not for no reason that alongside globalism, we have seen the emergence of what we call localism, not just even nationalism, but even localism, okay? So this global, local sort of interaction is a fact. In fact, they say, you know, no matter how global you are, you operate locally. You know, all of these multinationals, they are not operating globally. There is no such a thing as a global operation. They are all local. Now, and that's one issue that we, we miss. The diff and the global, the local is always national. 
Local is the building block of nationalism. Localism is nationalism, is the building block of it. Now, so it is, so you see this development. And then in the meantime, even the countries that used to be so called globalists, they were not globalists. Think of the World War I and the World War II. They, fought, they were fought in nation, by nations. It was the Germany, it was the Italy, it was the Japan, it was Britain, it was France, it was US. You see, they, they were not. They were not global forces fighting. They were national forces fighting to defeat the other side. See, there is a mysticism here. There is a problem here. They don't. They, they call about globalism. They don't open it. Globe is globalism is based on this very nationalism. You cannot be a globalist until you start with national. Even so is it fair to say? Is it fair to say that? A so nationalism... what I'm saying is that you cannot, even at global level, you cannot be a liberal unless you are national and local, you are global, you are liberal. I always say to the Iranians and my other friends who are struggling in third world countries for democracy, I say, listen, the first thing you have to do at your local level, at the local level, national level, you have to train some Democrats. These Democrats are not in global. There is no such a thing as global Democrats. They are in your locality. They are in your nation. You have to build democracy at home. And that means at the nation, at the national level, at the local level. So you think, so you think liberalism, Iranian... liberalism by definition, liberalism by definition is local. Liberalism by definition is national, as opposed to be like becoming like global. As democracy is by definition local. It is by definition national. So there is no contradiction in my view between globalism and democracy or nationalism and democracy or liberalism for that matter with globalism or nationalism. In fact, this roots of all the liberalism and democracy, that building block are local and national. Yes. So uh, that, that's a very good explanation of interaction between nationalism and globalism and, and the fact that nationalism can have a lot of good dimensions and the bad rap that nationalism has gotten so far is really only that. It's a bad rap and nationalism has a lot of potential, has a lot of un, untapped potentials that you know, societies like Iranian societies and Iranian communities and, and many, many countries that are ruled by uh, anti-democratic regimes should not really do away with nationalism because of the fact that nationalism is getting a bad rap in the Western world. And, and even in the Western world, you're saying that nationalism is actually on the rise. And even though even in the West, nationalism is getting a bad rap, even in the West, it can be the origin of a lot of goods for society. So maybe, so uh, let me pose this question to you. So a lot of Iranians at this point in their history, they have completely given up the uh, hope for, uh, for establishing democracy in Iran in the face of all the challenges that, uh, that the Islamic Republic is posing on them. And, uh, and they are hoping and they were wishing and they were rooting for Donald Trump to get elected, to get reelected for a second term. And because of the policy of maximum pressure that Donald Trump exerted on the Islamic Republic, they were hoping that Donald Trump will get a second chance to continue this pressure on the Islamic Republic and use this pressure to really disempower and diminish the power of the, of the Islamic Republic and be able to come to the help and the rescue of Iranian people and help Iran and Iranian people to establish democracy for, you know, for the first time in a very long time. Um, so, do you think this is an unfounded hope in, in America and in the West, especially the fact that Donald Trump was defeated and now there's someone in the White House, Joe Biden, who in the first few weeks of being in the Oval Office, he's been sending a lot of positive signals, a lot of um, friendly signals to the rulers in Iran, and Iranian people seem to be completely disheartened at the, at the prospect and at the, and, uh, at the uh, possibility of United States going back to JCPOA and whether going back to JCPOA by the United States 
is another one of those occasions where globalism will take precedent over local politics and dash the hopes of Iranians to establish a nationalistic based government that could bring democracy to Iran and use nationalism as a vehicle to achieve that. But a uh, very important question. First, obviously, there are two issues here. One is whether uh, Joe Biden can really uh, return to JCPOA. Can that it, will the JCPOA uh, will be negotiated again? And what kind of, uh, you know, uh, deal that would be? Remember, the JCPOA was a nuclear deal, and it's uh, neither Iran is in it anymore, not the US, and the Europe is also on the periphery. And it's a very complicated matter now. And I don't believe that the uh, Biden administration so easily could return to JCPOA. In fact, they have said it very openly that their return to JCPOA will be to a second JCPOA as opposed to the original JCPOA. They were to expand it, to extend it, to create all kinds of the vandal creating. But the issue of democracy is a bit different. I don't believe, my, my belief is that the problem democracy in Iran has is Islam, is the government. This government is an Islamic theocracy and is an Islamic theocracy that also, uh, okay, subscribes to globalism, but the religious globalism. Remember, religion are all globalists. Uh, uh, that the Iran was never their container. Okay, the container is that wherever Muslims live. Yeah, I think uh, I think the solution to democracy in Iran to revive nationalism, but a different type of nationalism, not the nationalism that was there was there back in the I don't know fifties, uh, for example, nationalism that now has to be revived is, an, is a complete total nationalism, what I call, what the total nationalism is. But you look at the definition of nation, nation includes the people, the geography, uh, the, the government, the, the culture and uh, civilization and the international relation. A nationalist will work on their people and on their economy, their politics, they, they will work on the geography, you know, uh, make the, the government, a better government and so on. So that, as opposed to the traditional Iranian nationalism, which is like very much like, uh, you know, resource nationalism or land nationalism. So uh, the, 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 so the, we need to take a, a, a broader, uh, a holistic view of nationalism and national, a total nationalism now. Now this nationalism, unfortunately, hasn't developed in Iran. And in fact, it has suffered tremendously in the hands of the previous old nationalists, okay, because they were so narrow-minded. And by, I believe, democracy movement without any basis. The democracy movement in Iran has really uh, been a movement against Iran and Iran, I Iranism, I, let's put it that way. You know, let me explain how, what I mean, you know. Uh, Again, if you go back to the history, you will see the British and others, they were first British and then colonialists. <laughs> they were first British and then they were, you know, the, the imperialists, whatever you call it. They were first British. They were British. They wanted the whole world to become British. They did not want to become Indian. As I said, the British educated wanted to make Indian, okay, to taste, to think like British, you see? So that's a reverse, that, that's a one-sided, one-directional universalism. That is, I am the best, I am the better one, Eurocentrism or whatever you call them, then you else, yeah, everybody else uh, be like me. In Iran, unfortunately, we have failed to really take Iran as a concept as a nation, remember when we say nation, we mean Iran in our case. And then we, we have failed to, uh, to conceptualize that nation in terms of its constituencies. And then to see what it is 
that harms these constituencies. And I believe the most difficult, there is, there is a good reason for Iranians like Trump, whether they were theoreticians or not, by intuitively, they knew that that's what they are missing. They liked Trump, believe me, because they liked Iran. Because it was, they were, Trump was saying, America first. And they intuitively were thinking, oh my God, it really means Iran first, too. So, so Iran is also first, but they had a government, a, a, a religious government ahead of them and in front of them, and they, that had, they didn't care about Iran. They cared about what they call Nizam, the system, the regime, okay? Uh, that is what has to be kept. Forget about the rest. So again, unfortunately, however, our democratic movement, um, our good people, educated people, fell into the trap of this regime, okay? By counterposing, creating a dualistic system of thinking between Iran and everything else. Iran, Islam. Iran, democracy. Iran, JCPOA. Iran, US-Iran relations. Iran, A, Iran, B. And that was the problem. But I am now these days advocating there is only one dualistic situation here. Iran, Iran. Iran, Iran. There is nothing, another thing, Iran, democracy, forget that. After we make this Iran, Iran, Iran first, then, all right, we move into the, the, the next direction. In a country, in a country that your life is in danger, your, your environment is in danger, your culture is in danger, your government is a, is a thief and a, a, a corrupt entity. This is, this is a that your, inter, your passport, your passport is below almost zero internationally. In that society, you can't develop democracy. I mean, it's just it's just a joke. For Iran to think in this terms is a joke. You have to build yourself first. This is a you fascinating know? conversation. This is a fascinating concept that probably we have to leave it off here because we are out of time and we are going to pick it up next day. And, uh, you know, so I'm going to summarize everything you said in, in 15 seconds. And so by this concept of Iran, Iran, you really mean that we are going to revive the concept and the benefits and virtues of nationalism. And we are going to shave off and scrape off all the bad attributes that have been associated with nationalism. And we are going to revive a constructive and a positive nationalism. And we are not going to be afraid of those people who are going to brand us with all kinds of derogatory names. And we think that nationalism is a very strong weapon to defeat the global, at least the Islamic globalism, and 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 probably is a is the only way really to to bring democracy to the Islamic world. And and I'm I'm with you on that. And I think we are going to have a fascinating conversation next time. And I'm. I thank you very much, Dr. Amir Ahmadi, for this fascinating my conversation. My pleasure. Yeah, pleasure. Very good conversation. Yes. And uh, we are going to pick it up from here next time. And thank you all for joining us. And sure. have a very my good pleasure. Evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.